So in this session, we will now go through a tutorial to PyTorch, which is uh, here you can find as tutorial 2, introduction to PyTorch. You can already see, so we have here various links on top where you can open it and call up. Um, and this is also what I will do here. So simply click on this button for open and call up, and you will get a view like this as I have here. Um, so it basically opens just the tutorial notebook, as you can see here from GitHub, uh, and gives you a view on it where you can actually run it. Most of you will actually also need to use the GPU, and therefore uh, in Colab and by default you don't have a GPU, but you can go to runtime and change runtime type and select here GPU. I don't do it right now because I'm actually running on a local computer to not uh, have here anything delays in terms of loading because Colab first has to send it to a server and you get back result. To uh, have it here a bit easier, I run it locally, but for you, I would recommend then to connect there to a GPU in case you don't have one yourself. The first part here, where I basically explain why we use PyTorch at Uber. There are many different deep learning and machine learning frameworks, including TensorFlow, JAX, CAFE, probably many of you have heard one of, or two of them. We specifically choose to um, teach PyTorch because PyTorch has a gigantic community, especially now in research. Most papers that come out, you will actually also find a, um, well, an implementation in PyTorch. And it is also very intuitive and flexible, easy to learn. That's why basically PyTorch then took over from TensorFlow, which was there first. Um, TensorFlow has been developed by Google, and therefore also you can see that a lot of people from Google are still using TensorFlow, especially also Node.js, which is also uh, related to that. But we will uh, focus here on PyTorch because it's just more intuitive and it is also widely used in research and this is also research masters. There are of course many other tutorials as well, so this one is not the only PyTorch tutorial out there. If you feel like after this tutorial you still didn't really get what PyTorch is, then I would recommend you to just go through other tutorials. Of course, feel free also to ask us, um, but there are also a lot of other resources out there and ours is definitely not the best or the only one. So just choose which, whichever you think is the best for you. If you run this notebook locally, also remember to activate the deep learning conda environment so that all packages are installed and you don't get any errors. On Co uh, Google Colab, actually, luckily, most of the packages are already pre-installed, so we don't have to worry about that. In the first cell here, we basically import most of our standard libraries we will also use um, in all of these notebooks. This includes NumPy, Matplotlib, so everything which you probably already know from the other courses. If you run the first cell, you usually get this warning that this notebook has not been offered by Google. Of course, um, we we didn't do it by Google, um, but you can really trust this notebook with, because we don't access any data on the Google Drive or anything. So there you can just click on it anyway. In the first part, so we will split this tutorial in two parts. The first part will be introduction to PyTorch in general, and the second one will then focus on how you can actually train a small neural network with PyTorch. So in this first part, we will uh, also actually explore the similarity between PyTorch and NumPy. So many operations and many concepts actually you see in NumPy are also there in PyTorch. Therefore, if you know NumPy, it's quite easy to learn that. The, on, uh, the main difference, or there are two main differences with PyTorch. One, it supports the GPU to have acceleration on the GPU. We will discuss later what exactly is the GPU and why it is faster. And the second part is that it allows us to do backpropagation, so meaning that we can calculate gradients. But let's first start with um, importing PyTorch. So you can just say here, import torch, torch is here, just from the original framework called Torch. And if you print the version, you should see something like 1.6. Um, recently, there just has been published PyTorch 1.7, so eventually, if you're on Colab, you could see that. And also extension of plus Q101, which would mean then CUDA 101, um, because there are different versions for GPU support. Uh, 
PyTorch, as many other frameworks also like NumPy, has a lot of stochastic operations. So if you generate, for example, random numbers, it is always a good practice to set the seed so you can actually reproduce your work, run the same notebook or the same script and get the same result out of it. So we can just do it here with torch.manual seed. The main concept of PyTorch is using tensors. So tensors, you uh, kind of know already from numpy arrays, so they are very similar to that. A 1D tensor is nothing else than a vector, a 2D tensor is a matrix, and we will often use higher dimensional tensors. This is, so as it's already very similar to numpy arrays, actually most of the operations you know from numpy arrays also work here on tensors. So if you want, for example, to create just a random tensor, you can just specify torch.tensor and specify the shape, so the number of dimensions you want to have. So 2, 3, 4 gives us three dimensions with a size 2, 3, and 4. So we can run it. And you see here we will get a tensor of that size, but actually we have few random numbers. So after you set the seed, you probably get to, uh, different numbers here. This is because PyTorch doesn't generate these numbers. Torch.tensor does nothing else than allocate memory in your RAM. And if and it takes basically whatever data is in the RAM. Therefore, these are really random numbers, and we want to overwrite them, of course. There are also then various methods how you could actually create a tensor which is um, which has already dedicated numbers in it. So touch that zeros creates a tensor with zeros, ones with ones, rands uh, between zero and one random numbers, and so on. So there are a lot of different possibilities you can create tensors with directly the numbers you need. We can, for example, do here that we create a tensor from a list. So if we can just specify what the tensor should actually contain as a list. And if we run it, then you see that you get a tensor with exactly the uh, shape and the numbers you have wanted in there. The second operation I wanted to show you is when a random operation, so if we say torch.rand and again specify the dimensions, then what we get out is basically a tensor with random numbers between 0 and 1. And there the seed is relevant, so if you run the same operation with the same seed, you should get the same numbers. Of course, if we run it now again, exactly this cell, then we will get different numbers because we have already sampled random numbers before that. The shape of a tensor, so the dimensionality, you also can get as a numpy, so you can just save to a, a to tensor x dot shape. Um, alternatively, you can also say x dot size, because um, in PyTorch we actually return torch dot size object, but you can access it as if it would be a tuple or a list. So you can see here, we actually say dim1, dim2, dim3, because x dot size, it just splits that up in numbers. So you can use it as it if it's numbers. Operations on tensors are also pretty the same as you had uh, known from NumPy. So you can just create two tensors here and add them. And it basically creates then another tensor, Y, which then contains the values of the addition. There are also alternative ways. So there you see we basically create an extra tensor. You can also do in-place operations. In-place operations means that one of these two tensors you sum actually then will store the result. So what we do here is x1 and x2, exactly as above. But we say now x2.add with an underscore, indicating that it's in place. And this means if we actually run it, we can see that x2 has changed, and x2 has now actually the values of a summation. These in-place operations are often useful in if you want to save memory, because it doesn't create a new tensor, it just reuses already memory you have allocated. You can also do um, many operations on the shape, as you probably know from NumPy. So if we create here, for example, a tensor using torch.a range, which is nothing else than NumPy.a range between 0 and 5, we can also change the shape of it by saying dot .view or dot .reshape. Um, dot .view is basically, it uses the exact same tensor with the exact same memory, but just gives you a different view on it. Therefore, it is called view. Um, but you can also, for example, then say permute, and permute swaps the two dimensions. So here you see from the six in a line, you can't 
you could have done two three, so you have now two rows and three columns. Well, here you actually swap these dimensions, so a row becomes actually now here a column. It's also sometimes quite useful to use this operation. Another operation we want to review here are matrix multiplications. So you already probably know them from NumPy, but here there are also different ways of doing it. Mostly these are different in terms of how you handle batches or basically additional dimensions, because matrix multiplications is usually doing on two-dimensional tensors, and then these different uh, functions all operate differently if you actually add more dimensions. We can just check here what happens if we do the standard matrix multiplication, which often is in neural networks, where you have the input, for example here x, which is a matrix, you have a weight matrix, which you would learn, and then you want to calculate the output. And the output is often used, for example, torch.matmal, and you can see it performs the standard operation of matrix multiplication. You can also check it by yourself if you want to do it by hand. Of course, there are also other operations like indexing, which works in uh, PyTorch as usual. So you can generate here again a different tensor, let's say here one with a shape of the N4. And then we can just get the second column as you would in NumPy or so on. We can get also, for example, the first row. So if we say just zero, it takes the first dimension, the zeroth element, which is exactly this row. We can also combine them again. Minus one always takes the last one. Um, this is until two, so we leave the first two rows. You can also take the middle rows. So it's basically everything you know from NumPy, you can also use here. One big advantage now of PyTorch is what we call here a dynamic computation graph. Because actually when you, co uh, when you run all these operations like addition or uh, matrix multiplication, what PyTorch does is it builds up a computation graph, so it remembers which tensors were in which operation and gave which output, because this allows you to actually then calculate gradients to the input. So if you have, for example, a loss, it would allow you to then calculate the gradients to the parameters of a model. How you can do that, so by default, uh, a tensor is defined as not requiring gradients. So if we create here a tensor with just three elements, and ask the tensor if it requires gradients, which you can do here with pro uh, property dot require squared. It actually returns you that it's false, but we can set it for any tensor to true, and then PyTorch will actually uh, record the gradients of this tensor. So if you perform the back propagation, you will find the gradients in this tensor. As an example, to get used to the concept of a computation graph, let's try to implement this function here which is nothing else than a short uh, sum with a square, another sum, and then taking the mean of our elements. Um, we can, just as an example, again, take as input that x is 0, 1, 2. Let's create it here. You see that I changed uh, the operation of a range a little bit. So first I define a d type, which is the data type. You should remember that you can only, so in PyTorch, you only can really calculate gradients for continuous values. Discrete values don't have naturally these uh, gradient support because, well, you don't really have these continuous gradients. You can also just say when require squared equals two, which does nothing else than this operation of a tensor which already exists to set it to two. Now in this cell, we basically calculate this operation up here, but I just split it into multiple parts, so we First have x plus two, which I store in A, then we square it, then we add d to it and take the mean. The idea of splitting it into multiple parts is that you actually see what computation graph it generates, and exactly this is the one you can see. So basically y will then depend on c, c is depending on a constant b and a tensor b, b is again calculated based on a, and a again uses a constant and um, the actual input. And now if we basically see, so if we uh, print the tensor y, you can also now see that actually it prints a gradient function. And the gradient function means that if we call this one, it actually back propagates the gradients from the output back to all tensors which require a gradient, and this would be in our case x here.
So you can actually start with backpropagation by just saying y dot backward. So let's do that. You can see it's, it's pretty fast with we don't get any output. But if we now check the gradients of x, so a tensor, we can always access the gradients by x dot grad. You see that we actually get gradients now in there. And you can also check it by hand. And this should come out exactly the same. So we perform here backpropagation over this graph that we calculate the gradients of x, maybe the influence of x on y. Last part I want to say here in the basics of PyTorch is the GPU support. So uh, as you might already know, in a computer, you usually have a CPU and now the day is also a GPU. GPU stands for graphics processing unit and it's quite different from a CPU. So it is designed to have a lot of cores and it is very good at operating on the same, uh, or basically operating the same operation on many data points. And therefore it is very beneficial for a neural network because it, we just have a lot of data where we actually want to perform the same operation on. Well, the CPU is very good at running these sequential operations, which is why a CPU is usually the core of a standard computer, but in a, um, for neural network training, actually a GPU can accelerate your training a lot. So PyTorch uh, natively supports uh, GPUs. You can just say torch.cuda that is available. CUDA comes from um, the NVIDIA package CUDA and CUDNN. These two uh, are there to actually then support operations um, like these on the GPU and therefore PyTorch um, really supports the NVIDIA GPUs here. So if you don't get your is GPU available, if you get it false here, then it means you don't have a GPU. If you're on Colab and get it false, then check again your one time if you have actually selected the GPU. On, on PyTorch, you can then say uh, on which device a specific tensor should be. So the device will be then, for example, CPU, GPU, or if you have multiple GPUs, you can also select which GPU it is. You can define it here. So good practice is always to define somewhere in your script a device object, which is then set to CUDA if you have a GPU and otherwise to a CPU, because this allows you to run the same script on both GPU and CPU. In this case, I have a GPU um, on here, so it also prints me a device of CUDA. Now, if I want to push the tensor to this device, you can just say x.2 and then the device object, or you could also say CUDA. And then it first takes a little bit because it has to initialize uh, everything on the GPU. And now you see if you print the tensor, it actually says device CUDA. You can also check the runtime, so usually, a GPU should be faster in uh, calculating, for example, now a large matrix multiplication. Um, always depends when, on what GPU you have, but here you can see that actually the GPU is much, much faster than the CPU on this large matrix. And there you see that using this GPU can actually help a lot when we do a neural network training. A GPU, as it is a different device, has also different random seeds. So it's always good to set these seeds as well so that we have it saved and therefore we have again a deterministic um, one basically of our script. Okay, this is the first part of the tutorial and in the next part we will now see how we can actually use PyTorch to implement our own little neural network and train it on some toy datasets.